Hello and welcome to another episode of Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm cr- crime correspondent Michael O'Toole. I'm really delighted today to say that we're joined by Professor Anna Sergi, who is a professor of criminology in the University of Essex. Now, we're speaking to Professor Sergi today because she, as I said, she's a professor of criminology with a focus on organised crime and mafia. So I've long wanted to talk to Professor Sergi about what you and I would call the mafia, but we're going to get into that. Um, it, it mostly, uh, it's Italian organised crime, really, and there's it's a really, really fascinating su- subject. Hello, Professor. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hello, Michael. My pleasure to be here. Now, you're an acknowledged expert on mafia, OK? Why did you decide to study mafia? OK, so you want the emotional answer or the professional one? Both. Both, yes. <laughs> okay, so the professional one. I studied law uh, at university and I went away from from where I was born. I was born in Calabria. And at the time, Calabria is the, um, oh, by the way, is the uh, region at the boot of the Italian, at the toe of the Italian boot. Um, and he, when I was growing up, it felt like I, there was nothing to do there. So I went away. I studied law in the north of the country, in Bologna. And I started studying, like many people, criminal law and uh, criminal procedure. The um, anti-mafia regulations were quite a big uh, hit when I was studying because there was a big, you know, reform at the time. So I got interested in that from a, let's say, a ju- judicial, or juridical perspective, which is where eventually I started um, putting my ducks in line, as, I mean, as people say, uh, going back to my youth and trying to figure out how the things I was reading in books made some sort of sense with where I was coming from. And this is where the emotional part starts. Because where I come from is a region that is not normally connected to mafia until very recently. So it's one of those regions that no one knows <laughs> uh, in uh, because it doesn't have the same uh, blended beauty of Sicily or it doesn't have the same um, comfort of Tuscany. So it's one of those regions of Italy which is very poor, very forgotten even by Italians. And yet again, it has a very harsh beauty, very uh, rural, you know, kind of uh, authentic, genuine self. Uh, But it's also extremely difficult to live there and to understand the place. so I, I don't blame anyone for not trying to understand it. But it, so that's also one of the regions which is mostly connected to organized crime today. It, but it's always been like that. So even if we now know the Ndrangheta, the Calabrian Mafia, has one of the Italian most important groups uh, for organized crime in Italy, this was always the case. So it's, it's one of those situations where when you grow up and you think, you normalize something and then you get out of your place and you realize that other people don't know anything about it. And it's just like, how is that even possible? I mean, I grew up with this thing and no one cares or no one seems to, you know, acknowledge it. So that's where my criminological uh, sensitivity came in. So instead of studying law, I moved on to sociology and then criminology because I wanted to understand how was it possible that in a region which knew a lot of a lot of the violence, a lot of the killings, a lot of the mafia intimidation that we associated with Sicily at the time, why was it the case that Calabria didn't make? I wouldn't say the news; it did make some news, but it wasn't the emergency that we as- associated with Sicily which, you know, is the reason why I became very involved. And also, my father, being a journalist at the time. Um, for one of the national newspapers, so he had this uh, this ability to narrate local stories for national audiences. So, as you know, um, you know, he had to pick certain things more than others to obviously fit the newspaper agenda or messaging. And it was very interesting to follow that and to go around with him in a time when media, well, where journalists actually had to go to places <laughs> rather than, you know, receiving phone calls at home. So we traveled a lot with him through the region. I learned a lot o- about the region and the mafia from him. Um, so I wanted to actually make some sense in a more professional way of this. Sorry for the long question. No, well, that, that, that was an excellent answer. Um, just one thing about Bologna. So that would be considered the north of Italy. Yes. OK, so um, I lived in uh, Vicenza. Up, up above a bit, up above. Yeah. Now, um, 
And I found at the time, so this was 1992, I found at the time there was terrible racism towards people from the South. Did you experience that in Bologna? Um, not in Bologna. I experienced that in Milan because I shortly lived in Milan. In Bologna, Bologna is a, is a university town and it's full of Southerners. Um, so the Bolognese are used to um, students at the very least. Um, in Milan, instead, where I had my first job, uh, that's where I um, was struck by racism towards the, um, yeah, the, the Southerner in ways that I couldn't even comprehend just, you know, for the sake of it. Um, so it was a very judgmental place. Now it got much better, I've been told. But until 2010, when I lived there, Milan was very difficult for Calabrians because we speak differently. We sound less refined. We sound, I don't even know how we sound really at this stage. But yeah, surely. Not in Bologna, but in Milan. Okay. So, um, so I, I was speaking off air to you that I'm from Belfast. So I grew up, I was born in 1970. So I grew up in North Belfast for the whole of what we call the Troubles. So the, the, the civil conflict. And you obviously lived in Calabria. Did that give you, as an academic, does it give you as an academic a better insight? Having lived in Calabria, do you think you're better equipped to do, to understand this? That's a complicated question because it's actually half of my job to figure that out in the sense that sometimes I think intuitively, yes, um, I do understand some things quickly or uh, in a way, in an intuitive way, in what I can only call an intuitive way. But that's also a bias, uh, which in research is not really acceptable. I cannot just accept this intuition without questioning it. So I had uh, to question my own bias in many occasions and trying to figure out, OK, I know this. How do I know this? And uh, this brought me to anthropological studies, which I never really did. I never really studied anthropology. Up apart from what I need now, uh, but it became a necessity because sometimes when you think you know something, um, it's ingrained in what we call culture, but culture is not a set in stone um, thing. It, does, it, it evolves, it's dynamic, it's social, and it's an experience. It's your own experience mixed with other people's experience. So sometimes you don't know why you know that. And for an academic, this is this is awful because it means that it cannot. That my research cannot be uh, presented as repli replicable and more importantly as understandable um, for the degrees of scientific scientific knowledge that I'm trying to push forward by peers. So uh, it's been actually probably more difficult than for other people to approach this subject. And it's not a case, if you think about it, that anthropologists go in and study places that they don't know. Then, you know, the normal anthropology goes somewhere where they know nothing about just an external observer. So there is something to that. There is a difficulty in figuring out why you know something and how to unpack your own knowledge uh, in a way that is at the same time relatable to the place and you don't so you don't lose it you don't lose your insight but at the same time it reaches the degree of scientific validity that you need which is yeah i'm not i'm not sure i managed to do that all the time honestly but i so, try so let me ask you this just to give you a parallel i have seen an awful lot of reporting about belfast and northern ireland that i consider terrible OK, really bad, really ignorant, really superficial I, I'm from people in England and people in, in the Republic of Ireland. Do you have you seen academic journals or academic work about the mafia that you think is appalling? Absolutely. OK. Today, it's uh, it's the reason why I set up a Google alert on the word Ndrangheta. It's uh, that's actually one of the reasons why I specialized in this, um, because it didn't make any sense when I started studying criminology, even when I was studying organized crime. So everything I read about the Ndrangheta and the Mafia more generally in those times, including academic stuff, some things, early stuff made more sense than later stuff, which is might be normal. But then I found out that actually a professor in London is writing made more sense than a professor in Italy. Okay. So I could understand the mafia, whatever that is at the time, or whatever that was at the time, much better through the lenses of studies done in our hamlets in London than in officially in Italy. So I, I tried to figure out why that was. And it is true that, unfortunately, mafias are very complicated topics and you cannot be just one thing when you study mafias. You have to be both an historian 
and uh, criminologists or a sociologist, a social scientist, whatever you are, you have to be able to uh, read, to have media critical analysis, um, archival knowledge. Uh, you need to be a little bit of a journalist, but not too much of a journalist because that you don't want to confuse roles and people are very mm-hmm. confused by <laughs> our role already. Um, so you, you have to be a lot of things together and not everyone has the patience or the ability to do so but it happens every day every single day i get more mad at this than i get to anything about anything else in my life well you know that, that's the same for me about ireland about northern i'll have to say now uh, one of the things you, which i'm interested in you've written a book called chasing the mafia okay and i, I must say I, I must recommend it i'm not finished i'm about 30 percent of the way through it's it's an excellent book I, I, what I really like about it is there's lots of detail in it, but uh, it's written, I would venture it's written in a very easy to understand way. So it's not very academic, shall we say. Thank you. So it's very accessible. Yes. But you learn a lot. So that book was difficult because um, I wrote it and then I couldn't find a publisher. <laughs> uh, because for academic publishers, it was too not too academic. Not academic. I mean, it was academic, but you know, they they said oh, it's only sixty percent academic. So, okay, isn't that enough? No, apparently. And for and it's not a trade book because it's too detailed. It's too you know dense. So eventually, I managed to find a British, well, the British publisher, uh, Bristol University Press, because they have an, a non-fiction academic kind of thing. So they were um, they ma- we managed eventually to put it, uh, you know, put it out. Um, but it gave me the dimension of what I'm trying to do, which um, I, w- I think that book was really my attempt to admit to myself and the rest of the world they no, this is not a normal topic for me. Mm-hmm. I've researched other normal topics, other, you know, proper research where you start with a research design and then you go into the field and then you learn stuff and then you come back, you write, and that was it. And you switch off at night. <laughs> let's let's put it this way. This is not something like that. So I have a bias. My bias must be embraced. I must declare it and I must put, put it out. You know, and in, in that book, there are lots of things that do not meet the threshold of academic validity. They are anecdotal, they are um, self-reporting, they are about my my reflections, my memory, which is obviously a fallacious one, um, community memory, which is also very fallacious one. So I, I try to keep together a lot of voices. Um, so it's not, it cannot be a proper academic book in the sense that some of my most orthodox, orthodox colleagues would require. Uh, I have had harsh criticals, critics about that book, but I also had some very good feedback from more adventurous <laughs> type of, of academics. Um, it, it just is what it is. I mean, I couldn't have written in another way. It was in my head. It was stuck in my head since I can give you the date, since the 16th of April 2015, wow. when I did a trip with some Australian journalists. Um, and uh, it's like, oh my God, I'm trying to find a way to narrate why am I doing this um, and what brings me to choose topics of research here and I might you know I might as well write a book and that's what I did a bit later. Now, so one interesting thing and it's quite I suppose it's quite obvious having read the, most of the good bit of the book we call it the mafia yeah but you talk about mafia okay so there's no uh, definite article so we've always perhaps given the impression that there is a group called the mafia but there's not. Yeah, yes or no, depending. There is the Sicilian Mafia is technically okay. the Mafia. Okay. Because it was um, arguably the first one and it was known as the Mafia before being known with as Cosa Nostra. So if there is something uh, that we still call the Mafia, that would be Sicilian Mafia. Uh, however, Mafias in Italy are a type of organized crime group which could be attached to any group, whether it's Italian or foreign. We have an article in our penal code, in our criminal code, article 416 bis, that says if uh, a criminal group behaves with these ingredients, then it's mafia. So, and that means it can be any nationality, any ethnicity, any regional specificity. Sometimes we had mafias, 
very local small mafias in a way we even had in italy the for the first time ever a few years back some uh, a nigerian group the black axe which has been um charged as with the mafia offense so it, it's a fairly um, sticky label let's put it this way but yeah we call about mafias plural with the lower m because it's a type of organized crime it's not a thing it's not you know, it's not just one thing, at least. So, uh, with that in mind, then we know about the Cosa Nostra. There, Cosa Nostra. There, there's the Sicilian Mafia. The Andrangheta are in Calabria, which is, as you said, it's in the tone. They're the main. Are there other? There are other mafias. Yeah, so the things that are the traditional mafias, as we call them, which are obviously Sicilian uh, Cosa Nostra and the Andrangheta in Calabria, and then the Camorra, uh, which is the groups of clans um, in the area around Naples and around the Campania region, which is just above, just below Rome, above Calabria. And the Camorra doesn't have an organization in itself, but it's a way of doing crime, um, Neapolitan way. And they've been very violent in the past, extremely rich um, due to drugs as well. Some clans are, some others are not. Some of these clans are mostly urban guerrilla, I would say. And then there is another semi-traditional organized crime group, which is the Apulian uh, Sacred United Crown, the Sacra Corona Unita. La Sacra Corona Unita goes in and out of fashion. <laughs> they don't seem to be that able to, how can I put it, um, survive a lot of the activity that law enforcement puts against them. But they come back in waves. So this is currently a wave where they're back at one of the times when they're back. Then there are um, smaller mafias, what the Italians call new mafias, uh, in the area of Foggia, which is the north of uh, Puglia, the, the so-called Mafia del Brenta, Mala del Brenta, which is in the northwest, um, northeast, sorry, of uh, Italy. We had a Mafia Capitale, which then eventually the court decided it wasn't a mafia. Capitale is the capital city of Rome, which was actively based on corruption. Uh, we have smaller mafias all around. Um, and by mafia, essentially, we mean a group which is able to use intimidation of the name, intimidation of uh, the label, uh, over a period of time that is that goes beyond the life of the members, um, which is um, creating fear and subjugation in the population around them. So people protect them, not because necessarily of fear, but because of consensus and in a way, a, a mix between consensus and fear. And they do this for financial purpose or for uh, so profit oriented or for power. Power meaning control of territory means um, uh, you know, governance, extra legal governance, control of activities. So these are mafias. So you have to have these ingredients. So you can see it's, it's fairly adaptable to many different things we have. Uh, and it's not just about organized crime. It's also about very local harm, very local things and the relationship between, you know, criminal groups and people. How did, was it, so the first mafia was the, the Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian mafia. How did, how did it emerge and how did other mafias develop? What was the, was there a catalyst? Technically, the Sicilian Mafia is the one we learned about, but um, we already know, for a, we've been known, known for a long time that the Sicilian Mafia, the Calabrian Mafia, and parts of the Camorra were born together. I mean, they, 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 you know, they were somehow starting to be active in the same period, which is before the unification of Italy. Italy was unified in 1861. Um, so we normally put their birth around the unification of Italy because that's when we start having data, really. Um, but this kind of behavior is linked to, um, obviously, the birth of the Italian state and the fact that the Italian state was, was born over um, an attempt to unify several souls of the Italian peninsula, with the south of the country being very different from the north due to a number of, obviously, historical uh, dominations as well. Um, so Sicily specifically had, um, you know, a, a very different trajectory in terms of who dominated what. They've been dominated literally by anyone. So Sicily has a stratification of cultures, which is difficult to find anywhere else. And the South overall has always been in this sort of um, colonial, post-colonial uh, mentality 
which is a siege mentality whereby everyone is attacking us and we protect each other. So um, those who try to justify the birth of mafias will tell you that, will tell you that mafias were a response to the suppression of the Italian state. And the, the Sicilian mafia was basically the, the you know, the political classes, uh, the richer classes of Sicilians trying to resist the dominance of the of Rome. Obviously, things are not like that. That would be way too, <laughs> you know, too uh, romantic if that was the case. But essentially, it's a matter of protecting the land. Uh, so um, obviously, the feudal system that used to be that used to be around before the unification of Italy became eroded by the unification of the country and uh, the acqu acquisition of the land by the state through various different peripheral um, institutions. And obviously people didn't like that. So there was, uh, you know, the, the people who were rich uh, landowners, they essentially uh, tried to um, resist this kind of acquisition and keep their privilege and their power. And at the, at the same time, the lower classes, let's call it that, um, were in, in that kind of position when they became... Um, so they were working the land. There is always this example that people make about citrus uh, and about lemons and, you know, the birth of mafia linked to lemons, but which is essentially the first racketeering. So if you want me to, you know, work on this land, then you have to pay because otherwise the land is going to get burned. And so it's, it's a, it was a way, again, you might look at it as a social mobility issue, but eventually it was just a matter to uh, respond to the uncertainty that we had at the time, the political uncertainty of Sicily being very different from the rest of the country, of Italy, generally speaking, but also of the South, and finding itself navigating a new unification, essentially, which tried to frustrate lots of the Sicilian specificities. Um, and then people never like to lose their wealth, essentially. So that's... So, to, to, um, just listen to you, it strikes me there was a, a, a political element to this. Is that fair? Absolutely. The Sicilian Mafia is political. It's always been political. And uh, it starts uh, political and in a way that other mafias don't have. So one might argue that the first, the birth of ma the traditional mafias is always local, is always about local issues, about protecting local interests, about... Uh, protecting the upper classes from the rise of the lower classes. So there is this, this element of political you know, conflict. But very clearly, it's about navigating local politics uh, in the face of a centralizing government, which uh, for the South has always been very problematic. It still is very problematic. So both mafias, um, the Sicilian Mafia and the Calabrian Mafia are born to handle at the local level the political instances that the central level doesn't care about. So, And that's why consensus is a big, big part of Mafia. That's why there's no real... The oppression came later on. The crime came later on. The drugs came way later. This is, you know, that's... It's a way, you know, it's a, a completely different story, but the Sicilian Mafia starts political. It remains political all the way. Well, and which mafia is the, the biggest and the most dangerous at the moment? Is it the Andrangheta? At the moment, uh, there is consensus. And by, the, by at the moment, we mean at least the, the last 10, 15 years, the Andrangheta seems to be the most powerful one for a number of reasons, which have to do with their wealth um, of the, well, not everyone, but at least the one, two percent of the Andrangheta clans are apparently very wealthy. They are very international and they manage to have this extremely profitable international network of thanks to obviously drugs and an ability to operate with different cells in different places a bit like you would imagine some terrorist group would do um so they um, and also because it took a long time for the italian state to understand what this mafia looks like uh, with an attempt to uh, played down uh, as a bunch of clans doing stuff together eventually in you know trying to lower the risk and lower the alarm um it, because it didn't look it looked nothing like cosa nostra cosa nostra looked at the core of its power cosa nostra was a gigantic um head or made of five six men but really led by one man um and this man decided of the you know the death of 
people and the um, survival of people and the survival of the organization was heavily hierarchical, extremely unified in certain places. And obviously um, that became the prototype of mafias everywhere, I hierarchical, family-oriented, but still, you know, quite a pyramidal. And the Ndrangheta is not like that. The Ndrangheta doesn't have a boss. It never had one. They have coordination mechanism, but there is never a time when one clan, um, you know, can somehow take over from the other one. And that means the, hand, you know, the overruling of the whole Ndrangheta structure. So the Ndrangheta structure didn't fit the knowledge of the Italian law enforcement for a long time. So now that they've discovered it, the panic, um, and obviously they realized um, the globalization is a thing also for mafias. So, you know, we kind of are playing catch up here at this stage. Okay, so are they involved in all aspects of crime or do they specialize in certain crimes? Uh, the Ndrangheta clans, uh, so let's put it this way, the, the Sicilian mafia, are now more linked to certain crimes in, than they used to be. So they are not linked to drugs, uh, maybe some distribution, but they don't import as much. They, if they import, they import to the Ndrangheta. So that's it's a different, it's a step down. Um, but they are mostly interested in um, EU fraud, for example, agricultural fraud. Um, they've been caught up in the usual racketeering. By usual racketeering, I mean extortion of you know shop owners and um, these kind of things. And they are also still, as always, very interested in politics, local politics. Um, you know, the local elections. They kind of are uh, the mass, you know the little puppeteers of local elections. So that's the Sicilian mafia, and they are kind of mostly successful when they handle big money uh, contracts from the government, from the European Union. And that's it. But also because they are kind of slow if that makes sense. They are not a reactive mafia or a proactive mafia. They are trying to maintain their status quo and to keep their money because they made a lot of money. So they're still trying to keep their money uh, out of the law enforcement um, perspective. The Camorra, the Camorra is, uh, is peculiar because there is not just one Camorra. There are many different groups. Uh, Neapolitan groups are very local in the city of Naples, which is a specific type of city. It's a one of a kind city and it does require a one of a kind mafia. Um, so it's a mix between what you might imagine in a Latin American town, uh, city with the different factions, the different districts uh, and different clans controlling different activities, which usually means, again, extortion, uh, some, you know, loan sharking, um, some betting, uh, investment in the... Um, how can I put it? This uh, Merchandising around football, which in Naples is extremely peculiar. Naples won the uh, Italian Cup this year, so the, it's a big thing for the city. Um, but also there are some clans of the outside of Naples, like the Casalesi clan, which is the one you would find in Gomorra, if you watch Gomorra. They are a little bit more entrepreneurial, very much into uh, the bot bottom-up kind of activity, so from the drugs, um, including the international drugs, especially the Spanish link, the Portuguese link that they have, the Moroccan link, and obviously some other links in Europe, all the way to investment into various different types of activities, specifically the uh, waste dumping, which has been a very important one for them. So they're mostly well known for that. Um, then it depends, obviously, on different plans. But their activity is usually lo lower, you know, local and uh, specifically, you know, uh, in inclined to remain local. Then Drangheta instead is, how can I put it? The, there is nothing that I haven't seen connected to the Drangheta, anything that goes from drugs to various type of drugs, obviously money laundering to a number of ways, um, infiltration of several different industries um, from waste to um, weapons to antiques to chocolate uh, factories to flower market in Amsterdam. So various different things. Um, but that's normal because that, you know, the amount of drugs that the Ndrangheta has been moving for the past 20, 30 years, for a long time being at the top of the oligopoly, uh, the 
run Europe. Now it's different, obviously, but up until a few years back, um, they were very much one of the few players. So the money is enormous. So this money needs to go somewhere. Uh, so that's why creativity has been has been boosted, I guess. Yeah. You mentioned money. How much? Sorry. How much money do these say that can? Is it possible to estimate how much money say that Andrangheta makes? Yeah, I don't think it's possible. You you read you will read a lot of um, speculation, I guess, uh, about forty billion, fifty billion pounds. But it's impossible to measure uh, because for a simple reason: because a you can't measure how many clans we have. Just one, we can't because it's uh, again. It's a semi-secret society, so it, it would be you kind of defeating the purpose. So we range between 140 clans, 160 clans, God knows. Um, some clans adopt the brand the brand name of the Ndrangheta, but they never really were Ndrangheta in the first place, or at least not originally. So there are a lot of free riders around with the name. Um, plus, a lot of what they do is we learn about a lot of what they do when they fail. So we can't really estimate uh, on failure. Uh, it's just, you know, it just doesn't work. So I never really trust the numbers. I think they are just, you know, smoke and mirror. But yeah. And, and you mentioned Gamora. I thought it was excellent. But you're, you're the expert. What, what did you think of it? I didn't like the book, um, but I love the se- the series. The series yeah. very well done. Um, I thought it was and, excellent. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not a huge fan <laughs> of the book, but yeah, it, I think the book uh, and the series itself portray well do a very good job in you know making accept accessible a reality which even for some Italians is very difficult. You know, some people have to watch Gomorra with Italian subtitles. <laughs> Because it's it's very difficult to comprehend, and I only understand seventy eighty percent of it through my southern dialect. Wow! So yeah, because it's it's very tight. Ne- Neapolitan culture is very unique. Um, so yeah. <laughs> now let, let's talk about clans because this is one thing I'm not really knowledgeable about. Knowledgeable about. So so there are organisations the Andrangheta, the Camara, the Santa Coro, Conora Unita, but but within each organisation there is a number of clans. So is that like sections or is it different familial groups or say neighborhoods or villages? What is what is a clan? That, that depends. So in the Sicilian mafia, um, clans are known as Cosca and the Cosca is territorial. So it's very much about how the city of Palermo was conceived. The city of Palermo, even today, is one of Italy's big cities. Um, it counts, I guess, three million people. It's not massively big, but it's still big, uh, two or three million people, including the interland. Um, and it's one of those cities which is obviously divided by very distinctive um, neighborhoods. So that's when you look at the map of the of Cosa Nostra in Palermo, you see territor- territories. You don't see names of, of families. You see names of places. Uh, so this, uh, this neighborhood, this neighborhood, this neighborhood, Costa. And then this means that various families will be part of this Costa who live there or at the very least to are have some connection with the territory even today that means also at the, the limitation of the territory and how they they work around their activities not to you know step on each other's food essentially so the, more generally the Cosa Nostra is territorial in the sense that Palermo has several different um cosca and several different mandamenti Mandamento is a group of cosque, <laughs> a group of clans, um, and various other towns in Sicily had the same. So you had, um, you know, for example, um, thinking about Matteo Messina Denaro, and who has been arrested in January, Matteo Messina Denaro was the um, head of the Mandamento of Castelvetrano. And which is his town, so, which means that every Cosca around Castelvetrano recognized him more or less as the boss. So it's it's a bit of a, you know, boxes inside boxes inside boxes, but mostly territorial. The Ndrangheta is the opposite. Um, the Ndrangheta is family first, surname based um, name uh, of what you would call a family clan, uh, normally meaning actual family bond have to exist, uh, brothers, sisters, uh, 
uh, you know, daughter, sons, whatever. Um, and the family clan is usually allied with other family clans um, to form the so-called locale. The locale means place and it's a locality. So that's where you would have, let's say, the Sergi clan uh, married with the Barbaro clan in the locale of Plati, which is a little village somewhere. But the fact that they are um, surname based means they can travel. So that uh, means that their reputation can move. So the Sergi clan is surely born in uh, Plati. But if the Sergi clan, let's say, representative migrates with his family and friends or whatever in Milan, they will still be the Sergi clan just belonging to a different locale, to a different place. So I think this this has given an edge to the Ndrangheta, which Cosa Nostra never had. Um, it's a complete different way of organizing. With uh, the, the Camorra is even different because the Camorra has um, similar organization to Cosa Nostra in the local sense, district-based, um, and also very much about alliances in the district-based, but not everywhere. So out of Naples, you have surnames. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a mix, uh, but also, again, they don't have the same type of organization that, we, that the other two have in terms of co coordination as well. Uh, one of the, I, I thought it was really funny and interesting in the book when you talk about going to Australia and you give your surname as Sergi and the Australian cop says uh, don't book a hotel in your name so the, the, the Sergis so the, about Sergis. Yes. so the, the, the Sergi clan travelled to Australia absolutely, the Sergi clan is the number one clan of Australia, uh, historically speaking and uh, now it depends what you mean by the most important uh, they are less important criminally speaking but they are extremely important for the identity of the Ndrangheta in Australia. And they are uh, strangely not linked to me by my dad's surname, which is Tergi, but my mom's surname because of the place we're from, which is next door to my mom's village um, back in Calabria. So it's, it, it did require also my <laughs> naivete, I guess, to go back and ask friends and family, hey, hang on, who are these people? And yeah, because eventually Calabria is very small, so chances are you are related. Um, not that everyone one in, with the Sergi family is related, but if you if you have the Sardin, you have the location, and the location is a village of two thousand people next to another village of two thousand people, there might be some links. So that's where I had to do. But yeah, I didn't realize until getting there um, that being called Sergi and doing research on the Australian mafia is not quite uh, <laughs> easy. So I, I've been thinking about this, and I think in Ireland the closest parallel I can, can I can find to a mafia, it's not even the IRA. I think it's the an IRA unit, a very well-known IRA unit, the IRA in South Armagh, which is just on the border. So the, the South Armagh IRA had a, a fearsome reputation as probably being the most elite unit within the IRA. And one of the things that was, so they would bomb, they were involved in bombing Britain and that sort of thing. But one of the things that made it very, very strong was it was familial. Yes. So it was families. So uh, that's why I was thinking there must be parallels there because it was very difficult for the, 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 the police and the British Army to infiltrate the South Armagh IRA because they were families. It was easier to infiltrate, say, for the IRA units from Belfast and Derry because it was geographical, like you're saying about Palermo. But the South Armagh, it was almost impossible to infiltrate because families. Would that be the same with the, 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 the Andrangheta when it is family, familial? It's more harder for authorities. Yes, yeah, so the Ndrangheta works through dynasties. Um, so they are, some of them are at the fourth, fifth generation, at the very least, that we know of. Uh, and I call them dynasties because that, you know, when you have a family that is intergenerationally involved in crime, uh, more than one generation, and they have a kind of a vision for what their crime is, there are things that make them recognizable, um, whether it's their place or their type of business or the, the, the modus operandi they have. Um, that's a dynasty in the legal sense. So that would be also in the legal sense. And these, some of these dynasties, the more they are successful at skipping generations, moving up generations, the less uh, they are um, infiltrated somehow by police or understood by police. So the ones that we, are, we know most about are the younger ones in a way. Um, but the dynasties, which in the Ndrangheta are about 15, 20 families, 
Some of them never had a collaborator, uh, a term no. code in their life um, within the family. Uh, I'm thinking of a specific family, which is the Piromalli family. They've been involved in the Gioia Tau report. They still run a lot of the activities around the hiring practices of the Gioia Tau report, which is Italy's most important transshipment port and the most important port for cocaine arrival in Italy as well. They are the most important family of the Ndrangheta, the most historical one ever, uh, all considered. Uh, and they never had uh, a break inside, nothing, none. Not even someone who by remotely talk said wow. something. Other families are not that fortunate, let's say. <laughs> let's put it this way. So they, you know, there are some stories about very prominent families where some member became, well, started collaborating with justice for various random reasons, including being afraid for their children or uh, the one woman who is um, the daughter of a boss uh, also being afraid for her children. She started talking and she became, you know, a very precious informant. Uh, but it's mostly it is about someone from the family talking. It's very difficult um, to understand. Obviously, you can intercept, surveil. That's clearly the case. But when you actually get the most results in Italy, it's because someone talks. The Ndrangheta has considerable less um, collaborators than other mafias. They are starting um, even now because the incentive now, the Italian state is providing more incentive as well. So that's, you know, that's one way. But yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult. When, the more the dynasty is traditional, the more they are orthodox in their historical uh, reputation as well, the less penetrable they are. And uh, it's, it's just, and also the more accepted they are. I'm just running this research in Gioia Tauro now, which is proving phenomenal and also very challenging because I, everyone, it, it's, let's put it this way. Everyone keeps saying there is an emergency in Gioia Tauro. This family is, you know, obnoxious and they are um, oppressing the town and the economy and da, 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 da. <laughs> the people there, it's it's the classic situation where the emergency is also, also only called from the outside. The inside doesn't see the emergency. There is no emergency here. We are fine. Now, that, that is really interesting because people will say that obviously the IRA were a very dangerous organisation, but, but people have to accept this. It, it may be impalpable to a lot of people, but the IRA were a popular organisation. In other words, they were an organisation from the people. Yeah, no, but absolutely. And um, mafias are, uh, in many ways, traditional mafias, especially the, some of the clans of the Ndrangheta and the Cosa Nostra. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as say that people want them. Uh, some people might, but it's, uh, they are accepted uh, because I, I was told, and I, I think I, you know, it, it, it's a powerful thing to say, by someone a bit aged, um, senior member of the community telling me, my goal in life is to live a normal, happy life, uh, whether it's provided by the state or it's provided by, by them, I don't care. And, you know, it's kind of like, it has a lot of things unpacked there, but it, it, it kind of gives you the idea. It's, it's you know, there is no emergency as the Italians, they tell you, oh my God, rise up and fight this. And people look around and say, well, what am I supposed to fight? These people have been here forever. We're fine. Everything is fine. So it's, it's quite mind blowing. Again, you know, the narrative is not really aligned um, in Italy at this stage with the, with the Ndrangheta especially. Now, um, we, we all here have heard about mafia wars, okay, and you, I think there've been a really a couple of really really bad ones which have lasted several years. Have they been, you know, say the Cosa Nostra against the Camorra, or has it been internal? Internal, always internal. Um, the actually the mafias in Italy have cooperated way more than the Italian state has, has ever realized. In the nineties, when uh, Cosa Nostra was coming out of its own mafia war, the last one where Totorina and the Corleonesi killed everyone, essentially, <laughs> to raise the power. Um, so there was not much war left. And then they decided to declare war to, war to the state and, uh, you know, become and enter the awful period where uh, they, they started killing outside the ranks. Um, there was some element of the Ndrangheta helping them. Um, so in a way, it's always been powerful mafiosi help powerful mafiosi. And then the lower level mafiosi kill each other. <laughs> the, 
that's usually the way it goes. The Ndrangheta has been extremely violent. Um, we have had many feuds, internal feuds, usually very, very local so that no one cares and until uh, it becomes about bigger cities. So one of the biggest, bloodiest mafia war um, in Calabria has been the one in Reggio Calabria that ran between 1985 until 1999 and only ended because Cosa Nostra entered into the scene and you know, apparently said, now you stop killing each other because we have more important things to do. Um, but this war killed over 1,000 people. And for a city like Reggio Calabria, that was, whoa, okay, this is not okay, right? Uh, so uh, that became national news. That became something like, okay, there is a mafia war. There was a curfew um, in certain areas of the city. So it became extremely visible in a bigger area. But normally the mafia feuds are in smaller places um, it is not true that they kill each other. They kill also civilians, unfortunately. But unless it's something not not worth it, newsworthy, like a child or a woman or whatever, um, it at some point again normalization has been the case. In in um, the Camorra, is very belligerent. Still, they still have quite heightened um, feuds in the city of Naples. It's just. You know, as always with organized crime, there is this uh, this idea: well, they kill each other, that's fine, as long as they kill each other. I, I, yeah, I think that's a terrible attitude. I get that attitude in Ireland about you know gangland crime, and they go, yeah, they're, but it's not. It's you know, some people can have had terrible childhoods and they end up in crime. They're not. They're not all criminal masterminds. Most of them are, are very unlucky. Is it, it just in relation to the wars? Is it clan versus clan? Yeah, normally it's alliance versus alliance. Um, so in the Ndrangheta, the, usually the alliance is about three, four families against another three, four families. But there, there have been cases of family versus family, literally. In, uh-huh. The Ndrangheta has been possibly most well known outside of Italy because of the Duisburg um, killings. In 15 of August 2007, uh, six people were killed in Duisburg in Germany. Um, which is extremely unusual for Germany to get, you know, a shooting in the middle of the street in front of a pizzeria. Um, and this was a feud um, between two families in a very, very tiny place in San Luca, Calabria. And it was a very long standing feud over 30 years with big breaks, but it has just been resurfaced a few years before um, with the killing of the other one of the other family members so you know retaliation came into germany and you know so that's very vengeance based um masculinity i would say it's it's just that it was just that to show off um you kill my wife because it was a woman that was killed i'm gonna kill six of yours in germany so there is a lot of you know very traditional revenge there but uh, as well as the mafia wars, I, I, I just read you Calabria, a thousand people were killed. I'm just trying to compute this in my head. How many people live in Reggio Calabria roughly? Wow, because say in the Troubles, what we call the Troubles uh, in Northern Ireland, there were 3,000 people killed, but there were one, were one and a half million people living in the north and, uh, you know, and the, the border areas. So that shows you how concentrated and how violent that Reggio Calabria war was. That's terrible. Very, ter- very, very much. And it was also among very important clans. So it kind of split the Ndrangheta in two because you couldn't, no clan could not take a side. So it almost became a whole of Calabria war because the Reggio Calabria clans are too powerful to, you know, they, they, they will affect everyone else. So, but hopefully, finally we managed um, somehow. And since then, there hasn't been any big, massive feud. But there has been, is it fair to say that at some stage, I know you th- I think you said this about Cosa Nostra, at some stages, mafias have waged war against the Italian state? Yes. How, how bad was that? Well, the um, period that we call the stragi, the stragi, the butchering, the slaughtering, depending on how you want to 
call it, uh, there is not quite a translation in, in English, um, started um, in the 1991. So after Fal Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino, who were two of the main investigators of the newly formed anti-mafia pool of Palermo, uh, brought to uh, court for the first time ever Cosa Nostra. Uh, over 400 members were brought to court. So the whole structure of Cosa Nostra was decimated. Um, the bosses were in, you know, con convicted. Um, first time that they used the new law that had been passed against mafia membership. So it was a massive trial. And we actually call it Maxi Trial. Mm. The Maxi Trial of Palermo ended what well, was confirmed in all its components in January 1991 and this up until that time the Gota of Cosa Nostra thought they could do the usual thing that they did to buy someone off uh, to corrupt the judge or you know find a way to escape last minute this didn't happen for a number of reasons which was also in the way the maxi trial had been conducted and that was too much uh, for the organization that you know clearly didn't want to be <laughs> jailed. So a, a number of killings uh, happen at the same time. Some political killings. Um, so people who were supposed to help politicians, Sicilian politicians who were sitting in Rome, who were supposed to help the mafiosi and didn't or couldn't, and they were all of a sudden becoming redundant or even dangerous because they knew too much. So they were, you know, on the, on the kill list. Giovanni Falcone, Paolo Borsellino as the main judges were on the kill list. A number of other people were also on the kill list, but hopefully they, you know, not everyone who was on the kill list made it uh, into the ground. Um, yeah, so there was a full declaration of um, we are pissed uh, because we were supposed to be protected by politicians. And we were, we don't really like this new wave of judges and, uh, you know, laws. And we demand a different course of action. We demand the state to negotiate with us, to leave us alone, to do what we always done. This ab arrogance uh, had never been seen in Italy. I mean, it's, it's and never was seen again. So it's a unique period of Italian history where for the first time ever, an organized crime group, a, ma a mafia group, uh, which up, up until the time had made money through heroin, a um, bit of other drugs, hashes, cocaine, some cannabis, doesn't matter, but mostly heroin and politics, political environments, political electoral exchange, vote buying, and eventually some contracts, some infrastructure contracts. So very cl classic, let's say, mafia group becomes a terrorist group and starts essentially terrorizing. So we have a first year, which is 1992, when these killings happen in a terrorist way, blowing up a whole um, motorway or a whole neighborhood of Palermo to kill Falcone and Borsellino. But also the, the, the year after, three attacks to the so-called um, uh, art patrimony of Italy. So in Rome, in Florence and in Milan, uh, three attacks, not to people, but to things, uh, representative of Italian you know, beauty and art, which is terrorist attacks. Was one of them the Uffizi? No, uh, yes, it was right. uh, closer, yes. Was okay. the, uh, the it was actually last uh, two weeks ago, the 30th uh, anniversary. Wow. So they, they attacked, They yeah, they essentially started using terrorist uh, mechanism. And then eventually, finally, um, because of the main guy, the main boss was in jail, Totorina was jailed. Uh, the other ones, uh, one by one, started, you know, eventually got jailed, apart from Matteo Messina Denaro, who finally we jailed this year. Um, but that season is a unique uh, moment. So did, did so this obviously, I, I, could, I, I, I was living in Italy at the time. I think I left Italy about two weeks before, is it Borsellini? Yeah. Uh, Borsellino, I think, was, the one killed in May. But they were massive bomb attacks as they were, I mean, like, Huge big bombs. So, what did, did did was there a reaction from the Italian state? There has to have been. There was a reaction. There were two types of reaction. One good and one bad, as usual. So the good one uh, is that the it, Sicilians, uh, not Italians, uh, first Sicilians reacted. So finally, finally, after you know that was the tipping 
uh, line and probably because um, Giovanni Falcone was a very peculiar man and he was half hated, half loved at the time, but you know, it, it kind of prompted the reaction, his, his murder prompted the reaction. Also because they literally bombed the motorway. So, you know, it's a massive thing for anyone in Italy to do at that time. Um, we were coming from years of terror attacks with the Red Brigades and everything. So to associate that type of attack to the Mafia seemed way too dangerous all of a sudden. You know, the escalation was too visible. So civil society uh, reacted. Uh, Libera was created, which is the Italian NGO. It was created in 1994. And um, that kind of, you know, the push towards a number of um, legislation, normatives uh, that Falcone was pushing through because Falcone at the time was working in Rome as a consultant of the Ministry of Justice. And he had this idea of creating the big anti-mafia prosecution, and, uh, the national one and the district one. So all of his vision, all of a, si all of a sudden became you know, speed it up. And finally, we approved everything he wanted in the space of a couple of years, which is great, um, because that really helped the anti-mafia fight. Falcone was a visionary and uh, in a good sense, he was a man with a vision. So that was a good thing. So civil society and eventually certain type of understanding. The other side was the complete Italy at the time was in a massive, massive problem because not only mafias was attacking, was attacking, but we had a ma another massive problem, which was Tangentopoli, Bribesville, a massive operation which literally destroyed the whole political class of Italy. The old parties were all embedded in into this corrupt network. The investigation from the Milan prosecution brought it down essentially. So the the old parties collapsed the new parties emerged. And with the new parties emerging, um, unfortunately, some, <laughs> how can I put it nicely without getting def defamed? Uh, but in, in some cases, the new the promises of the new emerging parties were um, pretending, obviously, to ride this wave of anti-mafia, but eventually just became um, a new way for people with money to enter politics and for mafia money to enter politics. And we know this because we know that when um, Silvio Berlusconi entered into power, at the very least, um, there, is, there are some doubts about his, his wealth and his uh, first hand man has been convicted for external mafia association because he was a Sicilian man li liaising with um, the Rome politics. So we, in that period, a lot went unchecked with this idea that we need to renew, we need to renew, fine. But you, know, you also need to look at what you are renewing uh, because then we ended up with 20 years of Berlusconi, but still. So is it fair to say that the, the Cosa Nostra lost that war? Cosa Nostra lost that war for sure, um, because after that war, we don't know what happened to Cosa Nostra. We only have speculation. We have some attempts to rebuild the structure. Well, Cosa Nostra clans are still there, uh, people are still there, um, some local business is still there, some coordination is still there, the local power, the local charisma, the local consensus is partially there, but there's never been an organization of the size and the capability of those period, periods. Um, there have been attempts to rebuild the so-called cupola, the so-called commission, of Cosa Nostra, but so far we don't have any knowledge that that's been the case. And with Matteo Messina Denaro arrested, there it goes, the last one standing of the last, uh, you know, generation of... That, that's, and that's an important point. So he had been on the run for, I don't know, 30 years and he was arrested. I think he was arrested in Palermo at a, a medical facility. Palermo, yes, but he was living in Castel Vetrano in his town. <laughs> So how how big uh, an arrest was that for the Italian state? Oh my God, the Italian state, state spent so much money on chasing Matteo Messina Denaro that we have probably spent on anything else in our life. Uh, it, it had become, um, it was the last one of a, a period that is extremely emotional for the Italian state. So they would never let this go. So the money invested in this has been enormous. Um, Matteo Messina Denaro was arrested very, I would say, symbolically, the day after Rina was arrested 30 years before. Um, he was also arrested in Palermo, which is, again, extremely uh, symbolic because he was arrested at home. Um, we all knew he was at home. 
Uh, but you know, you but might be surprised to find out how difficult it is to to find someone, even if you know where they are supposedly. Uh, so um, it, it's a uh, it's the closure of an era with Matteo Messina Denaro, the uh, '90s, the Cosa Nostra of the '90s, the one that reminds us what Cosa Nostra has been is gone. That's it, and it's much weaker today than it was years ago. Um, but it's been, I mean, even with Messina Denaro on the run, uh, Cosa Nostra, Matteo Messina Denaro was not the head of Cosa Nostra. He was the head of his own mandamento, his own area, but he was, his symbolic uh, presence, his identity as the, one of the closest men to Reina, one of the men again around the strategies, the, the, the slaughtering in the period, the 90s, was um, incommensurable for, the, for Cosa Nostra. Cosa Nostra could say, could bank on the fact that they had the longest, longest standing, you know, fugitive ever, and that someone of the caliber of Matteo Messina Denaro was still on the run. It was a very powerful identity building for the organization, and also, you know, the memory, the co the constant nostalgia for the past, that Cosa Nostra still has um, about when we used to be this powerful, um, which now seems quite pathetic, but when when you hear their talk, the, the way they talk about the past, it seems quite pathetic, but. You know, with, with Messina Denaro arrested, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's <laughs> where we went. There is a, an, another major figure who has been in the news in the last year, Raffaele Imperiale. Yes. I think he's become, I love this word, a pentito. Yes. Now, our Irish people will know him because he was a, a mafioso and he was linked to Daniel Kenahan and he was... Daniel Kenahan, of course. And now the, the, the Irish want to talk to him, like everyone else wants <laughs> So what what could you what what happens there? Will he talk to the Irish authorities? Will he give evidence to the Italian state? He will. He will give evidence to the American, to the Irish, to the whoever else wants him. The British, I guess. Um, the Spanish, <laughs> the Dutch. <laughs> Rafael Imperiale is a fantastic figure for a criminologist. Is um, because he defeats. Um, deterministic views of mafias. He's officially starting as a Camorrista, but in a very lower ranking area. It's, you know, his family links are not great links to Camorra clans, um, but the way he starts out is fairly... is because he is with the winning clan, <laughs> talking about the Gomorra and, you know, the fight in Gomorra, that's, that was a real fight, it mm -hmm. was with the winning one. With the Secessionisti di Secondigliano, with the Amato Pagani clan, and uh, they start, he started working for them with drugs uh, importation, but he became so good at it um, that, as you know, he eventually started his own business uh, and he, he was a broker for many different groups um, and he moved a lot of drugs for a lot of people. Um, I never liked and I never believed in this super cartel situation, mm. but uh, surely the way he has been working um, defeats mafias in the sense that it's um, it kind of, yes, he had this very, you know, far away um, belonging to this clan. He still worked for them at some point, but he, he really created a different beast. Um, and in that beast, obviously, he managed to coordinate with a number of other groups, uh, including the Kinahans, including obviously the, the Dutch, and um, which are needed to anyone who wants to move anything at this stage in uh, in Europe. So, Kin so Imperiale is um, is a very interesting figure, and he's, he's, he started collaborating because he's young. And with Italian laws, um, and that's probably where the Mafia Association comes to bite him because it's the fact that he's still technically almost associate to the Amato Pagani clan makes him vulnerable to anti-mafia laws, which eventually means that he's going to spend his life in jail. Um, and for someone who is barely 40 something, probably didn't seem like an appealing thing to do. So he is a pentito, in other words, he is a, a what we would call a super grass. Yeah. Okay. Um, if he does give evidence, I mean, this is just, I'm just asking your opinion. Yeah. If he does give evidence, or if he does help the Irish police with Daniel Kinnan, is that that I presume that is really bad news for Kinnan? Of course, um, the one thing that Imperial already did in Italy is to help um, prosecutors identify people behind the nicknames of Sky, ECC and Encrochat, because obviously one of the big issues of having a lot of messages is that no one signs Daniel Kinahan 123. They obviously have different um, nicknames and to be beyond reasonable doubt that that nickname belongs to that person is the core 
problem of anyone at this stage who's working with EncroChat and NCICC. So that that's what it did already um, and for the Italian side. So there was already a big Italian operation um, based on uh, Imperiale's uh, testimony, um, which involved a number of people in Italy, really important network of drug importers uh, involving Drangheta, involving people in the north, involving Albanian groups, involving everyone. So I would imagine that his contribution to the Irish uh, would be to put into context the messages that he, he knows are from the Kinahans, whoever from the Kinahans he was talking for with, including Daniel, maybe, and uh, to try and, and build a case against him. Um, I don't know how updated his knowledge. Obviously, Imperiale was arrested in 2021, so clearly there's a gap there or whatever Daniel Kinahan is at this stage. Uh, so we'll see. But um, so just just so I can expand on this, if he does give evidence, then you would would that mean that you know it's over for Kenan? If if the Irish courts do what the Italian courts did and accept the Imperiali's evidence, then he's he's in real trouble. Yeah, but I would think that it's not going that well for Kinahan at this stage either. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think from what I was reading um, with your you guys reporting it from over over into Ireland, it seems like he's working already on thin ice. Mm -hmm. So I think the important thing with uh, any organized crime group is to understand, well, it's the isolation that these people, the cornering, um, at some point, they will apprehend him, Kinahan. The problem is what happens when they apprehend him and uh, to try and figure out uh, what was in motion before they apprehend him, whether there's someone who's taking over, whether the brand is over and done, whether there is no more Kinahan after Daniel Kinahan. I mean, th these are all the questions that are for analysts, I guess, more than for police forces. But Well, well what do you think will happen? Just... I'd be interested. Well, in I mean, then some groups uh, bank on. So, in the case of Kinahans, their brand name has been their blessing as well as their, you know, um, problem. I guess. Uh, so it does depend whether they can keep, they can abandon the name and the brand, uh, but renew the network. The network is still there. Um, the, the drug network for sure. It's still there. Because it's still there because we know that Rafael Imperial is out, but some of his network is still there. Um, mm -hmm. so you can take the one guy out, but that doesn't mean you take the network out. So it really depends what kind of uh, uh, mechanism for um, the evolution of power has been in place with Kinahans. Is there a number two? Is there a number three? Is there a, usually in this kind of situation, you have to have another person which is completely out of the picture, but able to, you know, take over at a moment short, you know, moment notice. So that depends. But I think it's as always with organized crime, after a moment of quiescent, you know, rearranging of things, things will go back to what they were for a simple reason that you can't stop organized crime really. But but do you think it is it fair to say you do you think it's inevitable that Daniel Kinnan will be apprehended or found at some stage? Could be years, but they apprehended Imperiale, they apprehended Tagi. Why wouldn't they apprehend Daniel Kinahan? I mean, it seems, uh, it's just making it a little bit more <laughs> interesting, I guess, for many people. And probably right. that goes to say uh, seriously about the protections he has. Um, but I guess if we if we if Italians caught Matteo Messina Denaro, <laughs> I'm sorry for Daniel Kinahan. But <laughs> okay, Professor Sergi, this has been a fantastic chat. I, I have learned so much and I thought I knew a lot, but I obviously know nothing. So I'm really, really grateful and I hope our listeners will enjoy it as much as I had. Thanks very much, Professor. Thank you, fantastic. Michael.